I seem to have acquired a black poodle dog named Ivy, and Ivy is my dog. We have three standard poodles. She's one of them. The other two tend to be noisy and uh, will bark at things, including a mouse that's probably in the fireplace. But uh, You used to show dogs at one point, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, okay. All right, you can get down. Thank you. Yes. You already came and saw me already today, puppy. <laughs> yes. Tell me about caving in New Jersey. You know that? Right. <laughs> One of the more flamboyant members of the Met Grotto uh, was Howard Sloan. And Howard Sloan uh, liked to organize cave trips. He liked to uh, describe the cave as being magnificent and wonderful. And so when you got there, it was something less than that. Well, one day he said, uh, we've found a cave in New Jersey that uh, it, it's probably the biggest cave in New Jersey and we're going to have an expedition and we would urge everybody to come and bring extra carbide and uh, plenty of food and so on. We meet at a diner which was the, where the customary meeting place was for cavers and we uh, left the diner and went to this remote part of of uh, New Jersey. Well, I remember that the cave entrance wasn't anything that I had imagined. I, I could see a grand arch like Mammoth Cave or something. No, this was a hole about uh, uh, three or four feet high and maybe four feet wide. And Howard Sloan said, now, uh, since we don't know what we're getting into, we want to divide uh, the expedition into teams. So the first team is going to be the Pathfinder team, and they will find a way through the cave and mark arrows to be sure we all get out. And then the second was a mapping team, and uh, the third team was going to go down the first side passage and uh, survey that direction. So he lined everybody up and said, okay, let's go. So the first team went in, and which consisted of three or four people, and then the half of the second team went in, and by that time they had reached the end of the cave. There weren't any side passages. <laughs> It was a typical New Jersey cave, nothing like the wonderful cavern that he had uh, advertised so carefully. Howard Sloan was responsible for really putting me on the spot one time. We had an expedition to James Cave in about 1955, and... Uh, the Central Ohio Grotto, and we surveyed the cave and uh, and had a write-up of the cave, and I described a pit as being eight feet deep. Well, he uh, rewrote what I had written and called the pit 80 feet deep. <laughs> so subsequently, everybody thought that I had uh, made that mistake. <laughs> And uh, it caused a lot of embarrassment that Brucker didn't know what he was writing about. It was after the C3 expedition, uh, we in the Central Ohio Grotto, uh, three of us had uh, spent time on that expedition, feeling that it was the most inefficiently run caving expedition that anybody could possibly 
stage and that we knew all about it. And one of the things we objected to was that the whole thing was seemed to be done for publicity purposes because a lot was made of getting uh, Skeets Miller, the would-be rescuer of Floyd Collins, to go along and uh, several people from the uh, from the uh, Associated Press, uh, big time coverage of all this. So we decided that we ought to be able to stage an expedition to James Cave and cross over a pit and uh, get to the bottom of the pit that we knew was very, very deep. So we put together an erector set of pipes uh, and tested it in a nearby gorge near Yellow Springs. And you could uh, do a kind of a Tyrolean traverse across this pipe if you could get the pipe slung to the other side of the pit. This was before the days of single rope techniques and uh, and uh, power drills and so on for putting bolts in the wall. At any rate, we took all this down there and we uh, mapped a good part of, uh, of uh, James Cave and uh, we uh, we <coughs> Uh, wrote down everything we did. We took a lot of photographs and we tried and tried to get this pipe bridge strung across the pit. Well, we never did make it very well, but we did go to the bottom of the pit. Well, the pit was 240 feet deep. Uh, divided by six, it gives you 40 fathoms. Uh, so we described that, and uh, we went down there on a, a bunch of cable ladders strung together that Bill Holstrunk had manufactured. Uh, we got to the bottom of that, and uh, we ran out of time at that point, so we left. Well, we had signed a contract to do a major story for the Rotogravier section of the Columbus Dispatch newspaper. So I wrote up a story uh, under the pen name Warren Rogers, which is my middle name and my first name jammed together, about this very exciting expedition. Uh, and the, the money from that paid for all this pipe we had put together. Uh, <clears throat> but we just flat lied about getting across this pit, and uh, which made a very exciting photograph. The climax photograph was the person partway across this pipe, which was stretched across another pit, that is the eight-foot pit. So at any rate, we realized that here we had complained about the NSS running a publicity expedition, and here we'd done the same thing. Oh, embarrassment. And of course, at that time, we couldn't admit that we would look foolish. And, and at one time, we were caught by Bill Mixon. Uh, in that lie, and I confessed the lie to uh, a uh, group of cavers, and, and he was there at the time, and I asked for forgiveness at that time because we had just plain lied. And we decided at that point that we would not have anything to do with publicity in the Cave Research Foundation. At, at, our purpose would be to map the cave and to help manage the science and uh, encourage scientists to come and, uh, and forget about the publicity. We could finance this thing just by charging a modest fee to the cavers who came for food. It was not a 
profit-making enterprise, but it did pay for everything. So that was 1957 when we organized that. So James Cave was a rehearsal for <laughs> learning not to do caving for publicity, but uh, uh, if you're going to go caving, do it for the purpose of understanding the cave, not for any other purpose. Tell me about Bill Austin. Bill Austin uh, was, and for me, is still an enigma. I remember when we I first met him, he was probably a year or two older than I was, and uh, he had graduated from the University of Kentucky in civil engineering and was the manager of... Uh, Floyd Collins Crystal Cave. He was the nephew of Dr. E. R. Pohl, who was married to uh, one of the uh, Dr. Thomas daughters, and therefore had inherited Hidden River Cave and Floyd Collins Crystal Cave, as well as uh, Mammoth Onyx Cave. So. Bill Austin uh, was a, uh, a physically well-developed individual. He was tall and lean, and uh, according to Bill Austin, or according to Jim Dyer, he was among about the best caver in the whole world, and uh, so what we what I knew was that he was not forthcoming about anything about the cave. I remember asking him things, you know, uh, do you have a map of the cave? Uh, he said, well, there isn't a map of the whole cave. That's why we're having this NSS expedition. I said, fine, well, where can we tie this point to? And he said, well, there aren't any tie points. Well, <clears throat> after s several days into the expedition, I met Earl Theory, who's a caver from uh, Virginia or Pennsylvania, and Roy Charlton. And both of them had done some big time cave surveying. So we uh, were surveying and we did a lot of surveying because very often when you came time to eat dinner and go to sleep, somebody else was in the sleeping bag. So you go out and go caving and mapping some more. Well, after a few days of this, I told Earl Theory that we uh, were kind of lost because we're surveying passages, but they're not tied to anything. And furthermore, Austin is not going to tell us where any of this floating cave is. And of course, I asked him, why, why don't you tell us? Well, he said, I don't want the Park Service to know about this. And he said, there are spies in the NSS, and uh, so I don't want anybody in the NSS to know anything about that. Well, <clears throat> I had a, a uh, advertising brochure for uh, Crystal Cave, and on the back of it was what looked like a cave map, and the cave map had a legend that this was from an actual instrumental survey of the cave. It was the upper level of commercial cave. And I noticed that the uh, passages went all the way to the bottomless pit. Well, our C3 surveys were uh, a few hundred feet from the bottomless pit. 
And I said, you know, if that map is really a survey, and Bill Austin had denied that it was a survey, he said it was just a, a sketch. But why would you put on a map that it was an accurate instrumental survey if it was nothing but a sketch? So I said, we can test this out. We can uh, pick a piece of the cave and uh, take our compass and see which direction that passage goes and measure the passages turn to turn and get the scale. So we could not only get the north of this map, so-called map, and the scale on the map, but we could survey to the bottomless pit, tie our surveys into that if it was a real survey. Well, it turns out it was a real survey. So shortly after, and we told nobody on the expedition that we had surveyed to the bottomless pit to tie that in. Uh, Earl Theory and Roy Charlton and I spent a couple of weeks drafting a complete map of the cave, including the upper level, and superimposing the topography on that map. At the NSS convention in Pittsburgh in 1955, uh, we decided we would show Bill Austin the map. <laughs> And he had no idea this map existed and uh, invited him to the hotel room and unrolled this map, which was pretty good scale. And he looked at it and his jaw was working. Uh, he was obviously fuming, very angry, very in a rage, but instead he relaxed a little and said, okay, you guys win. <laughs> well, he found the map very interesting because he had always simply made line maps and ours had passage dimensions on it, so plus topography, so he had never seen any of this stuff. And yet we had put the cave together in a, in a way he had never seen it before. So then he said, well, you guys from Ohio can, uh, can keep going if you want to find more cave. And of course, that led to the setting up of the Cave Research Foundation and, uh, uh, and now ongoing uh, beyond 60 years of Cave Research Foundation exploring and surveying in what is now all Mammoth Cave. So, Bill Austin, uh, I think. Do you know who this is? Yes, that's Dr. Pohl. Okay. Uh, I was thinking, I was guessing it was him, but there's, he's not identified in the caption. He, Robert Pohl. Uh, that picture was taken with his first... Uh, first trip through the Austin entrance. Uh, shortly after the uh, C3 expedition, we made a trip into um, Crystal Cave and extended the survey from the waterfall trail out to a brand new discovery called Camp Pitt, down, and from Camp Pitt down a place called Storm Sewer to a place called Isla's Fish Trail. In other words, we got down to the river level in Mammoth Cave. And the river level led us onward, and uh, that eventually led to joining Crystal Cave with Unknown Cave. Uh, and when we did that, we could locate a place for another entrance. Bill Austin, by that time, was... Uh, pretty open with us, and uh, we helped survey through Unknown Cave to find the location of uh, an entrance that would put us deep in the heart of the Flint Ridge Cave System at one end of Crystal Cave. So we started to dig an entrance at that point. It took uh, most of a 
most of the summer to uh, dig an entrance. We helped by bringing down students from Antioch College to move the dirt and then after moving the dirt all Saturday and blasted rock, we would take them on a trip to the Lost Passage, a rinky-dink trip, which would wear them out. So we'd have to recruit more people who uh, didn't know what this was about and to come and help dig this entrance. Well, when the entrance was finally open, probably in, around Thanksgiving of 1954, or maybe it was 55, uh, Bill Austin took Dr. Pohl into there and that, that's where he made that picture uh, yeah. in, in Pohl Avenue. I was looking at, uh, looking through the old NSS newsletters and stuff and articles and pulling pictures of prominent people yeah. to, and it was my best guess that this was Dr. Pohl, but yeah. I, uh, I, I just wasn't sure, that's why I wanted to ask you. He was known as E. Robert Pohl, I'm not sure about his first name. He was a geologist and was a Mammoth Cave uh, geologist for a few years until he married into the uh, family, uh, the Thomas family. Yes, you talk about him being uh, uh, adding some legitimacy to the to the research because of his expertise as a geologist in in your. Uh, well, at least you talk about it in the, in the longest cave book. Well, I remember after after the uh, after the book that Lawrence and I wrote, the caves beyond appeared. Why I was nominated to be the editor of the NSS Bulletin, and uh, while there, I was talking to. Dr. Pohl and I said, you know, we found something that we uh, are curious about. And I said, every time you find a vertical shaft, it turns out that on the topo map, it's located very close to the edge of the sandstone, never under the sandstone, but away from the sandstone. And furthermore, you can spot these vertical shafts. And he smiled and he got a manuscript out of the bottom drawer of his desk and here was the, uh, a major white paper on vertical shafts. Well, he had observed the same thing at Mammoth Cave. However, he didn't write that every vertical shaft has a drain. <laughs> this was the key to understanding that vertical shafts are the karst chainsaw uh, in terms of uh, the speed at which uh, limestone is removed in Kentucky, uh, vertical uh, solution is very, very efficient and destructive compared to horizontal solution. I know I'd go out ridge walk with Jim Carter looking for caves, not in Mammoth Cave, you know, but just around yeah. and we always walk right along the limestone sandstone cap rock boundary right. because that's where where the pits opened up that's right and there was a particular kind of fern that tended to grow on the uh, on the limestone but wasn't up on the sandstone as much and so you could see almost even if it was buried you could almost follow the the contact uh -huh. by by following this particular kind of fern that we were we were doing, and we found a, a, a number of, of pits right that way. That's a good way to do it. You had uh, you were married first to uh, Joan Brucker, yes, and you had. Uh, four kids. Tell, yes. tell me about your kids. Well, Tom Brucker 
was uh, born in uh, 1954. Uh, he uh, has been very active in CRF for many, many years. He uh, went to Oberlin College uh, majoring in geology. Uh, he has been uh, a major explorer and surveyor at Flint Ridge for uh, years and years. He opened a high-tech repair business in Nashville and uh, about two weeks ago he retired and closed and had a yard or a parking lot sale of stuff from his repair business. So Tom Brucker is uh, now in his late 60s <laughs> and here my little boy is uh, an old guy now. <laughs> He won the uh, Lou Bicking Award for all-out gung-ho caving at one point. My uh, daughter, my second child, Ellen, did a lot of caving in the 1960s, late 50s and 1960s. She has uh, a photographic eye, that is the ability to see things. I guess it's artistic ability that came out of my side of the family. And uh, at a very early age I taught her how to do darkroom work, that is enlarging and dodging and developing film and so on, and she got very good at that, won several county fair awards for photography as a small girl and then took a lot of cave photographs and she uh, then the uh, second daughter after Ellen was uh, Jane and Jane lives nearby near Springfield she and her husband have uh, two children or uh, and uh, then Emily, my youngest daughter, uh, has been in Seattle for many, many years and has now moved back to Yellow Springs. So uh, Tom Brucker is still in Nashville with his wife and uh, my grandson Nathan, who is his child. So. Of everybody in the family, Ellen used to be a caver, and uh, Tom still is. Uh, the others uh, had no interest in caves. 